following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Tonight, we discuss the laws surrounding religious freedoms. Recent events have reignited the debate surrounding fundamental freedoms awarded to Sri Lankans through legislature. How is the freedom of religion protected under Sri Lankan law? What key pieces of legislature that govern these freedoms? And how do these provisions fare in comparison to international standards? A very good evening and thank you for joining us on Law, Land and Liberty where we bring to you key events in the legal sphere of Sri Lanka and breaking it down for the layman. Now, I'm pretty sure a lot of us uh, have heard uh, either through word of mouth or of course just watching the uh, television, we would have realized that the concept of the freedom of religion has come under question and has come under discussion in recent times. Now, of course, a lot of us would understand basically that a freedom of religion is basically your practicing of your own religion. But there's definitely much more to it than just that surface level thought. And to really guide us through this entire area, through this entire concept, we have someone that is not a new face on the show and has uh, been uh, very keenly uh, been discussing with us on previous segments as well on uh, previous areas of the law and we're very very happy to welcome you back onto the show President's Council Sivali Amit Rugula. Thank you very much sir for taking thank the time. Thank you very much for inviting me again. It's of a course. pleasure coming again back to the studio. Thank you very much sir. Uh, previously you did a, uh, multiple programs with yes. us and I hope that this time's program is also just as insightful as the other programs. Now before we get into the discussion uh, let's get you a breakdown on exactly how we're going to tackle this topic. Now of course first First and foremost, when it comes to freedoms, we cannot ignore the constitutional aspect of it. So we'll start off with constitutional provisions. Next, we will delve into the other aspects of the provisions that are already present in Sri Lankan legislature, such as the penal code, uh, which is the next most important when it comes to arguably uh, the freedoms aspect. And finally, we'll talk about the ICCPR and also international standards and how it compares to Sri Lanka's legal atmosphere. All right, sir. Well, without further ado, uh, it is a very relevant topic uh, as it's going rounds, uh, uh, especially in the general among the general public. Uh, but mostly, a lot of us don't know the very basics when it comes to this freedom specifically. So, sir, if you could start us off by exactly helping us understand what the key meaning, the essence of the freedom of religion is. Uh, permit me to start up this topic in saying. Anuradhi, religion is very personal to people. My religion is very personal to me and your religion is personal to you. And the rules and regulations that surround that religion is something that is adhered to by the adherence of that religion. So there will definitely be disparities. There will be instances where religions will not uh, uh, do everything in a similar fashion. But we all can come to the conclusion, all the religions that are practiced in Sri Lanka finally come into common, certain common grounds of living a good life. So on the one hand, we have the right to follow whatever religion we require. And that right is protected by the constitution. You ask me to lay down um, this right. And in doing so, permit me to go to the directive principles of state policy, which cannot be enforced in a court of law, but these policies guide the constitution, guides the law, guides the government. And in those, there are two provisions. Number one, number uh, uh, it's under uh, chapter 27, two, uh, and under, uh, under chapter two, tw uh, chapter 27, c uh, three, three, you will find a um, few provisions where this right has been laid down, if I may say. The state shall strengthen national unity by promoting cooperation and mutual confidence among all sections of the peoples of Sri Lanka, including the racial, religious, linguistic, and other groups, and shall take effective steps in the field of teaching, 
education and information in order to eliminate discrimination and prejudice. And also you would see that the state shall promote with special care the interest of children and the youth so as to ensure their full development, physical, mental, moral, religious and social, and to protect them from exploitation and discrimination. Policy-wise, religious freedom is laid down there. Then we have an instance where we can refer to the chapter on fundamental rights, the article uh, 10, every person is entitled to the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, including the freedom to have and adopt a religion or belief of his choice. Now, this is an infringed clause. This is a clause which survives any constitutional amendment. This is a right people have, which is an infringed right. So you can see in the highest form of the law, the right to follow a religion you want is protected. And that, I would think, is the greatest protection on free freedom of religion. Permit me also, before I wrap up, to say Article 99 of, sorry, 9 of the Constitution says, The Republic of Sri Lanka shall give to Buddhism the foremost place. Accordingly, it shall be the duty of the state to protect and foster the Buddha Sasana, while ensuring to all religions the rights granted by Article 10 and 14.1e. So you could see, even in Article 10, clearly laying down the position Buddhism holds in our constitution, it nevertheless reiterates the rights of all the other faiths. So this to me is a prima facie protection laid down by the supreme law of Sri Lanka, which is the constitution. So it is not that one can say that there is a lapse when it comes to the protection of the uh, freedom of religion, uh, but rather it is enshrined and entrenched. Yes. Uh, I think over, all, all over, the, I, for several centuries, way before this constitution came in also, we've had kings who have always respected different faiths and allowed those people to live in those kingdoms, practicing their own religions. And we can go even away from Sri Lanka. We uh, remember that very beautiful movie of Jorda Akbar. It reflects a historical perspective of Emperor Akbar. Emperor Akbar was a Muslim or a Mughal emperor. And he was married to the uh, uh, princess. Uh, uh, he, she was a Rajputana princess. She was a Hindu princess. And in that marriage, she was allowed to continue with her own religion. And he even made one day in the palace to be a vegetarian day. And he respected all faiths. This is in India, which is a very big country with so many faiths. So this is nothing new in the subcontinent. It is not something new to Sri Lanka. We've always fostered other religions, respected them, because the melting pot of multi-religious living has made Sri Lanka this strength, the force, that this country is moving forward. I suppose even in difficult times, our religions are the source of encouragement, Anuradhi. We always look at it that way. We look up to it. We ask for the blessings. So it's, it's, to me, it is a very important feature. I mean, one could say what they want to say, but one must have a look at very clearly the provisions. Then you will see we have a very uh, strong right uh, to religion. Of course. So now we know that, you know, through history and even in the present, they are enshrined, they are protected. Absolutely. Uh, they are in multiple areas of our key legislatures. Absolutely. So I think we should start with the most important legislatures. I feel like a lot of our viewers would appreciate yes. you guiding us through yes. uh, the most important, yes. uh, I believe, legislature. Yes. In, uh, I I'm happy that you all invited me to the uh, studio. We have several cases at the moment that are going, and I'm very happy you were gracious not to ask on those cases. We can't comment those are matters before a court of law. But, you know, it, my right to turn the walking stick while I'm walking on the street, Anuradhi, ends where your nose begins, you know what I mean? So I don't have an unbridled right of expressing whatever I want if it hurts the sentiments of a group of people who are following a particular religion. Law is a, you must understand, is law is a political, a religious. So the law is going to be very impartial on the issue. But the law is guided by the policy that it needs to protect the freedom of 
religious rights. In that sense, I think the supreme law, as I mentioned, was the Constitution. Next, I think we need to go into the penal code, which lays down the punishments for this kind of activity. Sir, uh, before we get into the penal code and yeah. the punishment aspect, yes. if you could elaborate a little bit on how all these religions have been guaranteed their protections under the constitution, if you could guide us through some yes. of the chapters. Yes, I think now as I said about the fundamental rights, fundamental rights clearly stay in the chapter. Article 10 is very clear about the right of one's religion and the choice of one's religion. So that allows a party to follow whatever religion that your conscience demands for you to follow. I think that is the greatest protection because the constitution is the supreme law of the country. And I even move into the state uh, 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 directive uh, principles of state policy and uh, fundamental duties. This is a guiding principle, non-binding guiding principle for the state to follow. That also includes. I even will go further to Article 14 of the Constitution. Then moving also to Article 9, which clearly says the place for Buddha Sasana, the, Buddha, the uh, uh, Buddhist philosophy and Buddhism, and also while guaranteeing the rights of all the other religions. I find that provision a very refreshing provision. Why do I say that? It also has not forgot to mention that other religions also should have their due rights. It's important to understand that. So while Buddhism has the prominent place or the place that is given under Article 9, which is the state to protect and foster the Buddha Sasana, other religions also have a protection. So it is the supreme law. So to me, Beyond that, I can't see any other protection because if one's rights are violated, you can always step into the Supreme Court. If it's violated by an executive action, you can always go to the Supreme Court and seek relief uh, because these are uh, rights that we are entitled by birth. And I would also want to stress something, Anuradha, which I very often state when I teach in the law college and also to the law students. These rights are inalienable. They are not gifts that are given by a government. They are given to us because we are human beings. And the state is bound to protect those rights. So in that scenario, in that atmosphere, I think we have the highest protection for the freedom of exercising one's religion. I see, sir. So the constitutional, the most supreme, it's the supreme law. legislature, that it, it completely ensures and allows your right to exercise, to practice your Absolutely. religion. That is Absolutely. the essence. Uh, theoretically, it is laid down. How it is implemented is by, you know, law enforcement agencies, but adjudication happens in this honorable Supreme Court. And we have lots of decisions that are coming. And those have strengthened the jurisprudence relating to these articles. Of course, we should definitely get into the uh, uh, practical aspect of the entire issue as well, but I think that is a great area for us to start off with, uh, uh, sir, uh, yes. that we have a, co the constitution essentially does not bar us from any sort of uh, unnecessary inequality. Oh no, oh no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I must be very clear with that, because Article 9 is a prima facie uh, evidence of that. While Buddhism gets the position it is uh, duly necessary to be given, other faiths are also protected. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important uh, provision, I think, to mention. Because many people mention only part of it, saying, well, why is Buddhism given that place? But don't forget, while Buddhism is given, that all the other faiths are also protected by that provision. But is there any sort of argument that they could make where it's specifically mentioned now that uh, you mentioned that the fostering of uh, the Buddha Sasana is mentioned uh, in uh, Chapter 9? Uh, Article 9. Article yes. 9, yes, I believe. Uh, so, sir, can one of other faiths uh, argue in any sense where there is... I am sure for argument's sake one can. But if one looks at the provision, it, if I may read again, it says the Republic of Sri Lanka shall give to Buddhism the foremost place and accordingly it shall be the duty of the state to protect and foster the Buddha Sasana. Kama, 
Kama, it doesn't stop there. Kama, while assuring to all, all religious religions the rights granted by Article 10, which I read earlier, and Article 14 1E. So it's very clear. Framers have been very clear. It's not one over the other. It is one given its due place while protecting the others. Of course, uh, there is. It's on equal footing. Abs I, I believe so. Yes. I believe so. Yes. My okay. humble opinion would be that. Yes, of course, as mentioned uh, in the constitution as yes. well. Answer uh, just a little uh, question right before we get into the break, sir. Yes. When it comes to amendment aspects, when it comes to the constitution and yes. all, has there been any uh, obstruction in sense to this specific area of law when it comes to? Uh, uh, the primary legislature and had there been amendments that have been made? I, I think Article 10, as I said earlier, is an entrenched clause. So it will survive any amendment of the constitution going into a new constitution. So that right is secured. Article 9 has been debated by many parties. But I think Article 9 is a very important provision. Uh, in fairness to the uh, other religions, uh, I'm sh I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I have witnessed on television religious leaders uh, of other faiths also have clearly laid their uh, uh, faith in Article 9 um, by saying Buddhism should be given this place which has been mentioned in Article 9. Because uh, predominantly a majority of people living in Sri Lanka are Buddhist. And the Buddhist culture and Buddha Sasana has been the greatest influence this nation has borne. But don't forget, it is not at the cost of any other religion. Uh, uh, looking, at Buddhists, looking at Buddhism, the philosophy, it is based on tolerance, you know. It is based on tolerance. So uh, I don't think there is any obstruction, but of course, Anuradhi, you must understand uh, parties, people will have their views in trying to change and bringing them, which is also democracy, which is also democracy. So you have to weigh and see whether you want to do away with it or would you want to continue with it. I believe the consensus, this is again my personal belief, my belief is the consensus is that Article 9 should continue because it has not been offensive to people uh, or to a religion per se. Uh, I must say that. Of course, uh, subject to any criticism that might also be, of course, it's a democracy. People have a right to say what they want within the framework of the law. Yes, of course. And uh, I mean, despite the democratic process that's already in place, we can uh, positively say that there is no sort of expense that other religions have oh, to I, I don't think so. Yes. I don't think so. I mean, I think uh, uh, um, His Eminence, the Cardinal, has gone on record uh, clearly indicating and also the Catholic Church has gone on saying the position uh, what Bud where Bud the position Buddhism holds in this country and I have a great respect for his eminence the cardinal for saying so you know because that really truly brings the spirit of cohabitate with other faiths you know what I mean so it's uh, Definitely. it's it's the maturity of religious leaders to emit such encouraging thoughts. Definitely, and now that we have got the basics, the very fundamentals uh, of religious freedom down, I think it's perfect segue for us to get into the next key piece of legislature, which is the penal code. But before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us. back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in discussion with President's Council Sivali Amit Bhagala and we were talking about religious freedoms and we got down to the very basics uh, where our supreme piece of legislation, the Constitution, enables and allows people their religious freedoms uh, in their respective religions. Uh, of course, without any uh, discounts to any religion. Now that we have gotten that very basic idea down, the foundation, I think we should uh, go further in, uh, uh, into the next piece of legislation, which is the penal 
Penal Code, which mentions religious freedoms among other freedoms. Yes. Um, so if you could really elaborate for yes. us. It mentions religious freedoms in this way. If somebody threatens the religious freedom of another party, how would that party be dealt with under the criminal law? It's criminal. It's actually criminal to go and obstruct another person from exercising his religion. It is not only a violation of a fundamental right if it's an executive action. Otherwise, if it's an individual who does it, then it becomes a criminal conduct. Mens rea and the actus reus element would come in. So many of the times, my observation is that the police has framed uh, a complaint or later on a charge on the base, basis of section 120 of the penal code, which is uh, uh, exciting or attempting to excite dissatisfaction. Of course, when you read this profession, provision, it clearly uh, relates and reflects on the state. Uh, if I may read, whoever by word either spoken or intended to be read or by sign or by visible representation or otherwise excites or attempts to excite feelings of dissatisfaction to the queen or her government in Ceylon, which now is a republic, or excites or attempts to exercise, excite, excite hatred or contempt of the administration of justice, or excites or attempts to excite the queen subject to procure, otherwise than by lawful means, the alteration of any matter by law established or attempts to raise discontent or disaffection amongst the queen's subject, or to promote feelings of ill will, hostility between different classes of such people shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to two years. Now, this is a broad uh, concept, if I may say. It doesn't only encompensate, or if it doesn't sort of it include religious freedom. It includes any sort of exciting or a dissatisfaction that is caused, dissension that is caused in the government of Her Majesty, which was drafted at the time, which is now a republic, being a republic, the government. So that is a section that the police tends to put, I must say. But I agree there are two more relevant provisions. And those relevant provisions are Article, sorry, Section 291, um, 91, 91A, 91B of the Penal Code. These are very important three sections. Do you know, Anradi, religions do gather they have their assemblies and they will conduct their congregations uh, and they will exercise their religion. And section 291 clearly states, disturbing a religious assembly is an offense. And it lays down a, 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 a punishment of imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to one year with or, with a fine, with or without a fine. Or it could be both. So you could see uh, where the law lays down how a religious assembly should be treated. And it's criminal to disturb or to intervene and not allow them to conduct their rights. Uh, next one that you will see is at, uh, section 291A. Uttering words and with deliberate intent to wound religious feelings. This is very important. You know, Anradi, our religious leaders, be it Lord Buddha, be it Lord Shiva, be it the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be, be upon him, or even for that matter, Lord Jesus Christ. All our religious leaders have propounded the theory of philosophy with great effect, with great experience. When people who live in the modern day feel that they can refer to these religious leaders in a very casual, derogatory fashion, it may lead to the uh, deliberate intent of wounding the feelings of the people who follow it. It may. Because any religion will hold its religious leader in high esteem. And if we are people who couldn't conquer things like our religious leaders, who are we to talk about our religious leaders in a very casual way? So this particular section in the penal code is very clear. It 
even makes it clear in the next one. Uh, section 291b, deliberated malicious acts intended to outrage religious feelings of any class by insulting its religion or religious beliefs. Now these are all attracting prison terms if you are convicted. So these offenses guard the, free, uh, the, uh, the right or the freedom of one's religion. It's very important. I have a right to follow my religion without my religion being belittled by parties who uh, do not follow that. In the same way, yours. So it's very important to understand. Now, you might ask, what does it mean by religious, uh, uh, the feelings uh, of the parties? It depends on the facts of the case. As I said earlier, we must understand why do we venerate religious leaders? Why do we respect? Because they are greater than us. They've laid religions and philosophies that are greater than us individuals today, living today. So just because we feel that we want to make a point, how can you bring religious leaders into a conversation which is derogatory, tell me? If you do that, it will affect the sentiments of certain groups of people of that religion. So, and also it can lead to disturbances. This is where the government is very clear. You see, it is applicable to all religions. It doesn't matter whether it is a majority religion, minority religion, religion, it doesn't really matter. It's a religion. So the penal code is very clear as to how the law enforcement will act in an instance of this nature. I think this is very important for us to remember. ICCPR and its influence, all that is important. But a basic law, criminal law, penal code lays down that. We spoke about the constitution. Now we've come to the criminal law. The criminal law also lays down how religious freedom will be protected. So that basically is the answer to your question. Of course, I mean, the penal code clearly, it enshrines all those rights and prevents yes. any sort of injustice happening in yes. a criminal sense. And that's where the punishments lie now. Yes, it is criminal, uh, Anuradhi, when these things happen. So if deliberate intent to wound a religious feeling is a criminal offense. So one must not think it's a casual thing that you can do. So if you are doing it, you must know that you are not allowed to do that. And on the other hand, outrage religious freedoms of any class by insulting its religion or its belief. So that certainly includes religious leaders. No? So Definitely. it's very important. I think you have to really identify this. Tolerance means respect as well. Dignity also includes treating people with dignity at the same time the religions that they believe in. You know, it's associated, as I said earlier, personally to them. You know, religions are very personal. So I believe as I, 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 uh, my parents have taught me when I was very young that two topics should not come into the dining table and that includes politics and religion. I agree with that. You know, that has a very important um, sense of being wise, you know, because people have different opinions relating to that. And it can bring out certain feelings which are not so pleasant. So these are also criminal offenses, as I said, in answering to your question. Definitely, and these religion feel, religious feelings are protected uh, under the law practically. Absolutely. Now, sir, I think that we have a good grasp of the basic foundation where the constitution comes in and also how it is uh, practiced uh, yes. uh, very practically through the penal code. Yes. I think a lot of our viewers would be very interested to learn a little bit about the key case law and key judgments uh, that has yes. occurred in this area. So if you yes. could... Uh, I, I could basically talk about some of the cases that are coming up in the fundamental rights jurisdiction, Anuradhi, because uh, our jurisprudence on fundamental rights and religious freedoms have been greatly developed by the Honorable Supreme Court and the justices who have been and who are presently in the Supreme Court. Uh, as I've gone on record in saying Sri Lanka's democracy has always been protected by the courts of Sri Lanka, not by politicians. Our court system is probably the backbone of Sri Lanka's democracy. And the courts have clearly laid down in decisions what this right really means. Uh, it is actually important to understand it has two sides of a coin. It's like a two sides of a coin, if I may say. On the one hand, you must allow the religious 
groups to exercise their religious rights. At the same time, you must not persecute people uh, if they don't really violate the religious rights. Uh, so these laws should not be utilized to clamp down on parties which probably will not come within the realm of such violation, but perhaps have done certain other things. So it's very important that when these matters go to court, the court will adjudicate and give a decision. As you very rightly and very importantly stress, judicial decisions add flesh and blood to the plain provisions of the constitution, you know, and also the statutes. So uh, permit me to mention two cases. I don't want to take a lot of time. There's lots of cases, lots of them, and all of them are important. And there is one particular case that has gone into my mind uh, uh, quite um, forcefully, which is the Karuala Gaswava Vidanala Geswarna Manjula versus uh, CIV PJ Pushpakumara, uh, SCFR number 241 slash 14. Which was decided, uh, which was decided on the 18th of July 2018 by His Lordship uh, Honourable Justice Prasanna Jayawadana, uh, is a very very uh, uh, important judgment. It related uh, uh, parties which were following uh, a particular religious group known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, and in that particular case it was clearly laid down what religious freedom is. And uh, going by that decision, which is a very well researched, uh, uh, very well reasoned decision, I would think, uh, one could really grasp and understand uh, that how the Supreme Court has viewed this freedom of religion and the respect to the religion. I cannot do justice by reading the whole judgment to you, but I think by citing the judgment, I hope our viewers will be able to go through. I've cited the number as well and the date of the judgment, and hopefully you will be able to go through it. But in that judgment also, another judgment has also been cited that uh, caught my eye, uh, which is Joseph Pereira versus the Attorney General, uh, His Lordship Honorable Justice, Sharvanandan, Chief Justice at the time, uh, held, I quote, one of the basic values of a free society to which we are pledged under our constitution is founded on the conviction that there must be freedom not only for the thought that we cherish, but also for the thoughts we hate, end of quote. That really touched my sense, you see. Look at how the Supreme Court has viewed this. The tolerance, um, you know, as much as I admired my religion, I have a right to tolerate the rest. So I am afraid I can't refer a lot of judgments. Uh, these are two judgments that caught my attention. And uh, although I've uh, cited these, there are many other important judgments as well. Despite there being a plethora of very relevant yes. judgments, uh, you have, I believe, picked out the cream of the crop when it comes to explaining to the viewer exactly how uh, the uh, the freedom of religion has been ensured. Anuradhi, that was my personal choice and my personal view. But as I said earlier, the Supreme Court consists of a large number of judge judgments. And as an officer of court, I'm very proud of the court system because they have laid down, as I said, the flesh and the blood to the dry bones of our constitution. It is making the constitution a living one. And for that, I must say, as I said earlier, the freedom of one's religious rights are protected foremost by the constitution, practically by the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka. All right, uh, that was a very significant uh, segment, I believe, when it comes to understanding exactly how the courts have not essentially failed us uh, when it no. comes to public sentiment. Uh, so I think it's very important now that we have mentioned the key pieces of legislature. So I think we should get into the collateral aspects of this entire area of law. But before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Lawland and Liberty. We were in conversation with President's Council, Sivali Amitabhila, and we were talking about religious freedoms, and we just finished a very significant segment when it comes to understanding how the freedom of religion is protected within our key legislature in the country. Now, of course, a lot of us uh, are probably already aware that it's not just uh, the Constitution and the Penal Code, but also the ICCPR Act that's also in place uh, that we can refer to when it comes to religious freedoms in our country, albeit not completely uh, entrenched in the Sri Lankan law. So, sir, I think a lot of us would uh, really benefit from understanding exactly how this functions and what provisions are mentioned in this. Yes. You see, international law and domestic law of Sri Lanka has a relationship which is based on the concept of dualism. Every part of international law that is made does not automatically become our law, Anradi. Uh, it is only that part of the law which is, uh, which is incorporated, encompassed in an act of parliament and passed by our parliament that becomes our law. It is worth noting with uh, a sense of gratitude. It was actually Her Excellency President Chandrika Kumaratunga during her time who decided to accede to the ICCPR when she took over power. Uh, which was a very, very important uh, uh, situation because Sri Lanka proved to the world that we were also ready to uh, allow international law to become part of our law. And not only that, that we have endorsed certain basic rights that have been laid down internationally. So it's very important to understand that when you are living as a country or existing, you can't live on your own, Anradi. You have to have relations with other countries. So the initiative taken by Her Excellency, the President at the time, was very timely, was very appropriate. But it must be said that although uh, uh, Her Excellency did uh, accede to this convention as President of Sri Lanka, uh, that it took rather a long time for it to come into our law. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR Act number 56 of 2007, so it came in 2007. So nevertheless, now it's part of our law. So whatever that is incorporated in this particular act from the ICCPR becomes our law. ICCPR in total is not. So whatever that is there, as I said earlier, dualist is part of the law. So it's in here, I think it is uh, <clears throat> section three. No person shall propagate war, advocate national, kama, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. Uh, this is a very important provision. Now, this is an international law provision which has come into our law, which is now law. And therefore, based on that, proceedings can also be commenced by the Honorable Attorney General if uh, 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 this sort of activity is conducted. And I must say, as I mentioned earlier, the penal code provisions also, getting bail also could be challenging on those instances because, you know, these are offences which are quite serious. So our viewers are uh, sort of, you know, notified that these are the limitations that are there and the ICCPR had come in and it is now part of our law. I have seen many in the media referring to the ICCPR. No doubt it is important and no doubt it's appropriate. But don't forget and throw the baby with the bathwater by just, you know, talking about the ICCPR when we have provisions in the penal code and also the constitution. All these in collaboration would come in to protect the rights of people in Sri Lanka and their rights to religious freedom. It's very important to talk about that because I think it's, as I said earlier, it is important. But at the same time, ICCPR is not the alone provision. We have many others as well. That It only strengthens it. I don't underplay it. I just say it strengthens it. I hope I answered your question. Yes, uh, you sufficiently did, but I feel like there's a little bit of a follow-up question yes. when it confirms that uh, uh, now we know that the Constitution and the Penal Code and several other pieces of legislature in Sri Lanka's law uh, in itself, our uh, key yes. legislature, do uh, does allow for religious freedoms in a very sufficient extent. Yes. But now the ICCPR has been brought in, and you just mentioned sir, uh, a specific area as well uh, when it comes to uh, war. And now my question to you, is sir 
are there areas where there is a lapse in our key legislature that is bridged by the ICCPR? I don't think there is one. That is my personal opinion again. Because I don't think there is a breach. I think the government, when they decided to take provisions of the ICCPR into our law, they only took provisions which they thought was necessary and they thought was appropriate. So that becomes our law, as I said, because we are a dualist, you know. And lock, stock and barrel of international law doesn't become part of our law. And when they don't make it part of our law, you can't blame them also. Governments also have a right to pick and choose what provisions they will bring in to their law uh, uh, if they are dualists. But if you are a monist on the other hand, the lock, stock and barrel will come into it. So I don't think it breaches it. I think the argument is interpretation of those sections needs to be done in line with international law. That is what are one of the arguments that have come in. And I think it has been interpreted. There's a very good judgment of Honorable Justice Alvihare, uh, which cites the IC, ICCPR and also the right to appeal, uh, which is uh, a decision given by the Supreme Court. And it has been really uh, interpreted uh, at the, in the background of the ICCPR and our law. So I think there is no breach. That is, again, my personal opinion on this issue. So there is no breach, uh, there is no breach. but it, the ICCPR does exist uh, in a sufficient sense. I think so. Yes. I think so. The Sri Lankan parliament has decided it is sufficient and I go by that. So I think it's important now that we mentioned the ICCPR, yeah. we should probably go into the international standards yes. as well because that's but the Before very... I go into the international standards, Anradi, permit me to say this. You know, religious freedoms uh, in a democracy needs to be protected not only by provisions of a particular uh, uh, constitution or the law of the government or, or, or the law of the country, sorry, law of the country. There must be clear political view on the part of the political leadership not to tolerate any interference with one's religious right. It's fundamentally important. I must say with great sense of respect, that the present president of Sri Lanka, the, His Excellency President Ranil Vikram Singh, in two instances have categorically stated that the respect to religion needs to be observed. And I think that has come from the top of our leadership. And I think it's very, very uh, encouraging because we see the president out of all people, the head of state, emitting clearly that religious freedoms must exist and intolerance to it will be dealt under the law. Permit me also to go to a parallel, you know what I mean? This I don't say with a sense of political uh, uh, um, encouragement, but just to say, the same president has gone on record uh, saying that the 13th Amendment should be implemented fully, which is quite right. It's part of our law. Legally. So it's important that the leadership emit what the law is. I gave that instance to say that this president, our president, has been very um, encouraging on those instances to say this is the law. And if you don't behave according to that, then the law enforcement should be uh, put into action. I think that's also important. Laws alone will not. Uh, leadership, government, Civil service, all must come into it. So I must add that as a private citizen, I was quite encouraged by His Excellency the President uh, taking his stance on these issues of zero tolerance on these uh, matters of you know, interference with religious rights and so on. At the same time, I just gave another example in saying, you know, leadership must be you know, bold enough to say, this is what the law is. You know, it might not be very expedient politically. It might not be beneficial politically. But the leadership is the, is the key uh, factor that should lead the people. And when you lead with a sense of no ulterior motive, I think that is also an impetus which allows the law to take its course. So I must say that as well. It's quite encouraging. Definitely. I mean, of course, there needs to be yes. a head-on uh, approach to this yes. entire uh, issue, especially when it comes to legislation. Yes. Very important aspect as well. But now that you mentioned the so leaders taking charge, uh, so on. Now, 
when it comes to the international scale, yeah. uh, can we see parallels in Sri Lanka or are we lagging behind? You see, again my personal opinion I'm saying that. <clears throat> Sri Lanka is a country which is multi-religious. And the melting pot of religions that exist in Sri Lanka has given a taste, a flavor that the Sri Lankans have got used to it. Of course, it's good to aspire to foreign international standards if they are benefiting us. But if they are standards by groups of people or organizations which benefit those organizations or groups, we have to be mindful. Our own homespun recipes have helped us over so many decades, centuries in maintaining harmony between ethnic harmony and religious harmony between people. So if those areas are lagging, I think they should aspire to come within. But in my opinion, I would think we have to have a homespun system. What is applicable perhaps to Canada? I'm talking about the secessionist movement in Quebec and so on. What is applicable in India? Uh, again, talking about maybe religious freedoms. Uh, what is happening with regard to uh, what is happening in Saudi Arabia? All those countries have their homespun standards. We might not appreciate what they do, but that's within their country. And that is their law. We must respect that. So I firmly believe Sri Lanka should have a homespun. If our standards are violating international standards, then it is a matter of concern. If it is not uh, violating, I don't think we should just move into it as of fashion or as of uh, vogue, if I may use the word, uh, because it makes us more international. Because I think uh, we've always done that, you know, emitted other sources, but we have to be original in our own, you know. It's very important. Look at how we've existed all this time. It's amazing, as I said earlier, amazing melting pot of cultures. You know, I mean, Anuradhi, may I say this? You know, in a nation where we eat rice uh, predominantly, as you know, sometimes maybe three, all three meals, maybe two, and so on. Do you know, in the city areas, the most favorite food that people take for dinner is koturoti. Where has Koturoti come in? You see, it pro probably is a cuisine that is influenced by various groups, religion, ethnics coming into it. You see, So the melting pot of cultures bring certain new uh, dimensions, creations, and so on. And we go with that. So I am not uh, uh, international phobic, but I think you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Of course, we need to maintain our own originality while, of course, conforming to what is generally the general consensus. Basic standards. Of, uh, yes, exactly. Basic standards. While we don't have to live up to other international to. Uh, frills, of course, we, don't. we just have to create our own uh, uh, authentic uh, Absolutely. Uh, That's the word. Authentic. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I feel like uh, that is a perfect note for us to end this discussion on. So unfortunately, while there's a lot more to discuss, uh, we have come uh, against time once again, sir. Uh, thank you you very much for taking the time to explain to our viewers about religious freedoms and I'm pretty sure a lot of us uh, will take with us uh, these key lessons and understand how to exercise within our rights. So thank you very much. Thank you very much Anuradhi for having me. It's a pleasure coming to your studios and wish you all the best. All right. Well, the freedom of religion is a concept that has continued to come under criticism over the years, in part due to the varying means of expressing one's religious beliefs. Now, despite this, it is pivotal that we understand exactly how the freedom is protected under law in order to exercise our rights within these means. We leave you tonight with the words of Professor Anantanand Rambachan, who is a professor of religion. Religious freedom is not a luxury. It is a necessity for human dignity, individual autonomy and the well-being of societies. It enables individuals to express their deepest beliefs, fosters diversity and promotes social harmony. A society that respects and upholds religious freedoms is one that values the inherent worth and equality of all its members. That is all from us here at Lawland and Liberty. If you have missed today's program, you can always rewatch the entire episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com/slash English. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Have a great night.